Cleveland Street Scandal from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at an.wikipedia.org. The Cleveland Street Scandal occurred in 1889 when a homosexual male brothel in Cleveland Street, Fitzrovia, London, was uncovered by police. At the time, sexual acts between men were illegal in Britain and the brothel's clients faced possible prosecution and certain social ostracism if discovered. It was rumoured that one of the brothel's clients was Prince Albert Victor, who was the eldest son of the Prince of Wales and second in line to the British throne. Officials were involved in a cover-up to keep the names of the prince and others out of the scandal. One of the clients, Lord Arthur Somerset, was an equerry to the Prince of Wales. He and the brothel keeper, Charles Hammond, managed to flee abroad before a prosecution could be brought. The rent boys, who also worked as messenger boys for the post office, were given light sentences and no clients were prosecuted. After Henry Fitzroy, Earl of Euston, was named in the press as a client, he successfully sued for libel. The British press never named Prince Albert Victor, and there is no evidence he ever visited the brothel but his inclusion in the rumours has coloured biographers' perceptions of him since. The scandal fuelled the attitude that male homosexuality was an aristocratic vice that corrupted lower-class youths. A few years later, such perceptions were still prevalent when the Marquess of Queensbury accused Oscar Wilde of being an active homosexual. Wilde sued Queensbury for libel, but his case collapsed. He was arrested, found guilty of indecency, and condemned to two years' hard labour. Contents 1. Male brothel 2. Notable clients 3. Public revelations 4. Aftermath 5. See also 6. Notes and sources 7. References 8. Further reading Section 1. Male brothel in July 1889, Police Constable Luke Hanks was investigating a theft from the London Central Telegraph Office. During the investigation, a 15-year-old telegraph boy named Charles Thomas Swinscoe was discovered to be in possession of 14 shillings, equivalent to several weeks of his wages. At the time, messenger boys were not permitted to carry any personal cash in the course of their duties to prevent their own money being mixed with that of the customers. Suspecting the boy's involvement in the theft, Constable Hanks brought him in for questioning. After hesitating, Swinscoe admitted that he earned the money working as a rent boy for a man named Charles Hammond, who operated a male brothel at 19 Cleveland Street. According to Swinscoe, he was introduced to Hammond by a general post office clerk, 18-year-old Henry Newlove. In addition, he named two 17-year-old telegraph boys who also worked for Hammond, George Alma Wright and Charles Ernest Thickbroom. Constable Hanks obtained corroborating statements from Wright and Thickbroom and, armed with these, a confession from Newlove. Constable Hanks reported the matter to his superiors and the case was given to Detective Inspector Frederick Abilene. Inspector Abilene went to the brothel on 6th July with a warrant to arrest Hammond and Newlove for violation of Section 11 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1885. The Act made all homosexual acts between men, as well as procurement or attempted procurement of such acts, punishable by up to two years' imprisonment with or without hard labour. He found the house locked and Hammond gone, but Abilene was able to apprehend Newlove at his mother's house in Camden Town. In the time between his statement to Hanks and his arrest, Newlove had gone to Cleveland Street and warned Hammond, who'd consequently escaped to his brother's house in Gravesend. Image shows an illustration of Inspector Frederick Abilene from a contemporary newspaper. Section 2. Notable Clients On the way to the police station, Newlove named Lord Arthur Somerset and Henry Fitzroy, Earl of Euston, both of whom were Duke's sons, as well as an army colonel by the name of Gervois, as visitors to Cleveland Street. Somerset was the head of the Prince of Wales's stables. 
Although Somerset was interviewed by police, no immediate action was taken against him, and the authorities were slow to act on the allegations of Somerset's involvement. A watch was placed on the now-empty house, and details of the case shuffled between government departments. On 19 August, an arrest warrant was issued in the name of George Veck, an acquaintance of Hammond's who pretended to be a clergyman. Veck had actually worked at the telegraph office, but had been sacked for improper conduct with the messenger boys. A 17-year-old youth found in Veck's London lodgings revealed to the police that Veck had gone to Portsmouth and was returning shortly by train. The police met and arrested Veck at London Waterloo Railway Station. In his pockets, they discovered letters from Algernon Allies. Abilene sent Constable Hanks to interview Allies at his parents' home in Sudbury, Suffolk. Allies admitted to receiving money from Somerset, having a sexual relationship with him, and working at Cleveland Street for Hammond. On 22 August, police interviewed Somerset for a second time, after which Somerset left for Bad Homburg, where the Prince of Wales was taking his summer holiday. Image shows a caricature of Lord Arthur Somerset from 1887. On 11 September, New Love and Vec were committed for trial. Their defence was handled by Somerset's solicitor Arthur Newton, with Willie Matthews appearing for New Love and Charles Gill for Vec. Somerset paid the legal fees. By this time, Somerset had moved on to Hanover to inspect some horses for the Prince of Wales, and the press was referring to noble lords implicated in the trial. New Love and Vec pleaded guilty to indecency on 18 September, and the judge, Sir Thomas Chambers, a former Liberal Member of Parliament who had a reputation for leniency, sentenced them to four and nine months hard labour respectively. The boys were also given sentences that were considered at the time to be very lenient. Hammond escaped to France, but the French authorities expelled him after pressure from the British. Hammond moved on to Belgium, from where he emigrated to the United States. Newton, acting for Somerset, paid for Hammond's passage. On the advice of the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, no extradition proceedings were attempted, and the case against Hammond was quietly dropped. Somerset returned to Britain in late September to attend horse sales at Newmarket, but suddenly left for Dieppe on 26 September, probably after being told by Newton that he was in danger of arrest. He returned again on 30 September. A few days later, his grandmother, Emily Somerset, Duchess of Beaufort, died, and he attended her funeral. The Honourable Hamilton Cuff, Assistant Treasury Solicitor, and James Munro, Commissioner of Police, pressed for action to be taken against Somerset, but the Lord Chancellor, Lord Halsbury, blocked any prosecution. Rumours of Somerset's involvement were circulating, and on 19 October, Somerset fled back to France. Lord Salisbury was later accused of warning Somerset through Sir Dighton Probyn, who had met Lord Salisbury the evening before, that a warrant for his arrest was imminent. This was denied by Lord Salisbury and the Attorney General, Sir Richard Webster. The Prince of Wales wrote to Lord Salisbury expressing satisfaction that Somerset had been allowed to leave the country, and asked that if Somerset should ever dare to show his face in England again, he would remain unmolested by the authorities. But Lord Salisbury was also being pressured by the police to prosecute Somerset. On 12 November, a warrant for Somerset's arrest was finally issued. By this time, Somerset was already safely abroad, and the warrant caught little public attention. After an unsuccessful search for employment in Turkey and Austria-Hungary, Somerset lived the rest of his life in self-imposed and comfortable exile in the south of France. Section 3. Public Revelations because the press barely covered the story, the affair would have faded quickly from public memory if not for journalist Ernest Park. The editor of the obscure, politically radical weekly, The North London Press, Park got wind of the affair when one of his reporters brought him the story of New Love's conviction. Park began to question why the Rent Boys had been given such light sentences relative to their offence. The usual penalty for gross indecency was two years, and how Hammond had been able to evade arrest. His curiosity aroused, Park found out that the boys had named prominent aristocrats. 
He subsequently ran a story on 28 September, hinting at their involvement, but without detailing specific names. It was only on 16 November that he published a follow-up story, specifically naming Henry Fitzroy, Earl of Euston, in an indescribably loathsome scandal in Cleveland Street. He further alleged that Euston may have gone to Peru, and that he had been allowed to escape to cover up the involvement of a more highly placed person, who was not named, but was believed by some to be Prince Albert Victor, the son of the Prince of Wales. Euston was, in fact, still in England, and immediately filed a case against Park for libel. At the trial, Euston admitted that when walking along Piccadilly, a tout had given him a card, which read, Pesez Plastique, C. Hammond, 19 Cleveland Street. Euston testified that he went to the house, believing Pesez Plastique meant a display of female nudes. He paid a sovereign to get in, but upon entering, Euston said he was appalled to discover the improper nature of the place, and immediately left. The defence witnesses contradicted each other, and could not describe Euston accurately. The final defence witness, John Saul, was a male prostitute, who admitted to earning his living by leading an immoral life and practising criminality. The defence did not call either Newlove or Veck as witnesses, and could not produce any evidence that Euston had left the country. On 16 January 1890, the jury found Park guilty, and the judge sentenced him to 12 months in prison. H. Montgomery Hyde, an eminent historian of homosexuality, later wrote that there was little doubt that Euston was telling the truth, and only visited Cleveland Street once because he was misled by the card. The judge, Sir Henry Hawkins, had a distinguished career, as did the other lawyers employed in the case. The prosecuting counsels, Charles Russell and Willie Matthews, went on to become Lord Chief Justice and Director of Public Prosecutions, respectively. The defence counsel, Frank Lockwood, later became Solicitor General for England and Wales, and he was assisted by H. H. Asquith, who became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom 20 years later. While Park's conviction cleared Euston, another trial began on 16 December 1889, when Newloves and Somerset solicitor Arthur Newton was charged with obstruction of justice. It was alleged that he had conspired to prevent Hammond and the boys from testifying, by offering or giving them passage and money to go abroad. Newton was defended by Charles Russell, who had prosecuted Ernest Park, and the prosecutor was Sir Richard Webster, the Attorney General. Newton pleaded guilty to one of the six charges against him, claiming that he had assisted Hammond to flee, merely to protect his clients, who were not at that time charged with any offence or under arrest, from potential blackmail. The Attorney General accepted Newton's pleas and did not present any evidence on the other five charges. On 20 May, the judge, Sir Lewis Cave, sentenced Newton to six weeks in prison, which was widely considered by members of the legal profession to be harsh. A petition signed by 250 London law firms was sent to the Home Secretary, Henry Matthews, protesting in Newton's treatment. Image shows a newspaper clipping, captioned, American newspapers claim that Prince Albert Victor was mixed up in the scandal. During Newton's trial, a motion was brought forth in Parliament to further investigate Park's allegations of a cover-up. Henry Labouchere, a member of Parliament from the radical wing of the Liberal Party, was staunchly against homosexuality and had campaigned successfully to add the Gross Indecency Amendment, known as the Labouchere Amendment, to the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1885. He was convinced that the conspiracy to cover up the scandal went further up the government than assumed. Labouchere made his suspicions known in Parliament on 28 February 1890. He denied that a gentleman of very high position, presumably Prince Albert Victor, was in any way involved with the scandal, but accused the government of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice by hampering the investigation, allowing Somerset and Hammond to escape, delaying the trials, and failing to prosecute the case with vigour. Labouchere's accusations were rebutted by the Attorney General, Sir Richard Webster, who was also the prosecutor in the Newton case. Charles Russell, who had prosecuted Park and was defending Newton, sat on the Liberal benches with Labouchere, but refused to be drawn into the debate. 
After an often passionate debate over seven hours, during which Labuchere was expelled from Parliament after saying, I do not believe Lord Salisbury in refusing to withdraw his remark, the motion was defeated by a wide margin, 206 to 66. Image shows Henry Labuchere, captioned, Henry Labuchere accused the government of conspiring to hush up the scandal. Section 4. Aftermath. Public interest in the scandal eventually faded. Nevertheless, newspaper coverage reinforced negative attitudes about male homosexuality as an aristocratic vice, presenting the telegraph boys as corrupted and exploited by members of the upper class. This attitude reached its climax a few years later, when Oscar Wilde was tried for gross indecency as the result of his affair with Lord Alfred Douglas. Oscar Wilde alluded to the scandal in The Picture of Dorian Gray, first published in 1890. Reviews of the novel were hostile. In a clear reference to the Cleveland Street scandal, one reviewer called it suitable for none but outlawed noblemen and perverted telegraph boys. Wilde's 1891 revision of the novel admitted certain key passages, which were considered too homoerotic. In 1895, Wilde unsuccessfully sued Lord Alfred's father, the Marquess of Queensbury, for libel. Sir Edward Carson, Lord Queensbury's counsel, used quotes from the novel against Wilde and questioned him about his associations with young working men. After the failure of his suit, Wilde was charged with gross indecency, found guilty and subsequently sentenced to two years hard labour. He was prosecuted by Charles Gill, who had defended Vec in the Cleveland Street case. Prince Albert Victor died in 1892, but society gossip about his sex life continued. Sixty years after the scandal, the official biographer of King George V, Harold Nicholson, was told by Lord Goddard, who was a twelve-year-old schoolboy at the time of the scandal, that Prince Albert Victor had been involved in a male brothel scene and that a solicitor had committed perjury to clear him. The solicitor was struck off the rolls for his offence, but was thereafter reinstated. In fact, none of the lawyers involved in the case were convicted of perjury or struck off at the time. Indeed, most had very distinguished careers. However, Alfred Newton was struck off for 12 months for professional misconduct in 1910, after falsifying letters from another of his clients, the notorious murderer Harvey Crippen. In 1913, he was struck off indefinitely and sentenced to three years' imprisonment for obtaining money by false pretenses. Newton may have invented and spread the rumours about Prince Albert Victor in an attempt to protect his clients from prosecution by forcing a cover-up. State papers on the case in the Public Records Office, released to the public in the 1970s, provide no information on the Prince's involvement other than Newton's threat to implicate him. Hamilton Cuff wrote to the Director of Public Prosecutions, Sir Augustus Stevenson, I am told that Newton has boasted that if we go on, a very distinguished person will be involved, brackets P.A.V. I don't mean to say that I, for one instant, credit it. But in such circumstances as this, one never knows what may be said, be concocted, or be true. Surviving private letters from Somerset to his friend, Lord Escher, confirm that Somerset knew of the rumours, but did not know if they were true. He writes, I can quite understand the Prince of Wales being much annoyed at his son's name being coupled with the thing. We were both accused of going to this place, but not together. I wonder if it is really a fact or only an invention. In his correspondence, Sir Dighton Probyn refers to cruel and unjust rumours with regard to PAV and false reports dragging PAV's name into the sad story. When Prince Albert Victor's name appeared in the American press, the New York Herald published an anonymous letter, almost certainly written by Charles Hall, saying, There is not, and never was, the slightest excuse for mentioning the name of Prince Albert Victor. Biographers who believe the rumours suppose that Prince Albert Victor was bisexual, but this is strongly contested by others, who refer to him as ardently heterosexual, and his involvement in the rumours as somewhat unfair. Image shows Prince Albert Victor, captioned, Prince Albert Victor of Wales was created Duke of Clarence and Avondale the year after the scandal. Section 5. See also. LGBT history, 
and LGBT rights in the United Kingdom. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation Licence, available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash fdl.html.